Welcome back. We're here at the 400th day. No, no, it's only the fourth day here uh, uh, in Davos, uh, HuffPost Live, uh, our coverage of the World Economic Forum. Uh, a real pleasure uh, at the moment. We have uh, William McDonough, who I, we were trying to discuss how I could uh, introduce him because he's so many things. He's a designer, you're an author, um, you're a leading voice in sustainable um, uh, lifestyles. When you, is your business card this big? Actually, it's very simple. It just has my name, my telephone number, and my email address. That's it. Right. So they, it'd be like, uh, you know what I do. I don't know what to say. I mean, it depends. I do lots of things. Pick the one you want. Well, speaking of that, you know, just looking at the things that you're working on later, it's, it's, it's a massive spectrum. I mean, you're working on from the space station mm -hmm. to the oceans, mm -hmm. the garbage. To, to yeah, molecules. To molecules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you... Let me, I just had this thought, wasn't going to be the first question. Multitasking, do you, do you find yourself distracted or do you have a really regimented way of approaching, I do this at this time, I do this at this time? I collaborate with lots of people and I see all of these things as one design assignment. If you look at the planet as our palette and we realize that that is the world we inhabit is, the, is both the, the, the thing that we use but the thing that we need to celebrate and restore now. We've been using nature as a tool and for our purposes, and we end up disposing of it and so on and so forth. I think it's time for humans to become tools of the natural world. And in order to do that, we have to restore butterfly habitat. We have to design products that eliminate the concept of waste. Well, that gets very commercial very quickly because why would a business make something it can't sell? And the value propositions are huge, so it's very exciting. So we design everything from safe chemistries, to products, to packaging, to buildings, to cities, to whole systems like we're working with now with the Chinese and circular economy. Well, I was thinking about reading some of the stuff, you, you know, very practical stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And you frame it in a different way, though. I don't think most people look at their cereal box, for instance. I know you're working mm -hmm. on, on this area. And you go, wait a minute, this is a collection of toxic items uh, holding the stuff I'm about to put into my body. But you look at it as, as part of this holistic picture where we're right. either in balance or out of balance? Right. Well, as a designer and wanting to do principled innovation, we design into the biosphere or the technosphere and try not to confuse the two. So if we're going to design something that's going back to soil or water or wear it on our skin, we would like that to be safe in our biosphere. So no more toxins. No, and if we can reuse these things, create methane with them, use the methane for making plastics instead of the atmosphere, put it back to soil, those are biological cycles. If we look at technical cycles, I make a computer or cell phone, I don't mind using lead in a telephone as solder as long as I'm gonna get it back and use it again in the technical cycles. The minute it gets to the biosphere, it's a toxin, see? So we keep these very carefully managed as design. So when I looked at the cereal box, the cereal box is made of recycled paperboard and the inks from the magazines that went into it are now, which many of which are not safe for human consumption, have migrated through the high density polyethylene bag into the cereal in measurable quantities. So as a design, if I'm sitting in a dumpster where I like to sit, I like to sit in garbage cans, in a, met metaphorically, because then you have a very low center of gravity and you can look up and say, what are you sending us? Really? You know, what am I supposed to do with this? And so if you're in the dumpster and somebody sends a cereal box, you've got this paper thing cover these inks and glues that are undefined. Nobody's going to pull out the plastic bag. So if you recycle as paper, it's contaminated by plastic. If you recycle as plastic, it's contaminated by paper. Silly. And so now I've got the bag with the cereal in it left over, and I've got these migrated toxins or whatever, and now how do I recycle the plastic? I can't because it's got food in it. So I look at that whole thing, and then Walmart's hired me to redo uh, the cereal box. And we're starting with that in their private label, and we're looking at it as a biological nutrient package, very simple, that you'll recognize as a cereal box. But if it get, gets to the waste handling systems, it's seen as a biological nutrient, the whole thing, the inks, the glues, everything. And it can be sent to methane production and sent back to soil safely. So it's a biological nutrient packaging system. So we're looking at all the foods being packaged this way so we can use it for soil health and, and like that, and then technical materials and we're developing marking systems so we can see them in the system. We know which is which. That's a lot of fun. 
Yeah, it's a way of contemplating the, our daily lives uh, in a different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I know you've said that a lot of the packaging has sort of dominated the product. Right. Uh, you know, it becomes this thing. Right. And, and you forget what's the, the, the purpose. Well, often I just saw a thing with certified organic gluten-free kale chips. And the package is one-fifth of the weight. There's no mention of what's in the package. And it's not recyclable. It just says no gluten, you know, no no GMO, no, no, no. But the package might as well say not recyclable, no defined pro materials, you know, no use to the future, you know, <laughs> whatever, no value. But we don't mark the package, just the content. Go figure. Um, as we've talked about, you've, you, you have your hands in so many different mm -hmm. things. One of the things, obviously, that made a lot of news, got a lot of attention, was your work post Katrina mm -hmm. in, in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, could you give us a status report with uh, your work down there that you did with Brad Pitt? Sure. Well, Brad and I, after, after Katrina, decided to see if we could help out. And because Brad had a house, down, Brad lives down there, he's very dedicated to New Orleans. So we looked at the, we decided to help in the Lower Ninth Ward. So rather than do a house or a demonstration, we decided to do 150, and we hired architects from all over the world, and then we helped them with their cradle-to-cradle -cradle thinking on their materials, all of them. And so we started building houses. We're at about 110 now. We're going to do 150 total, so we're doing pretty well. You know, it's not easy to do this stuff. And so the materials are as safe as we can make them and so on. The houses are lifted above the flood, so they are flood houses, which is an obviously good idea. But my favorite stories are that the kids are coming back from the FEMA trailers with asthma. And once they're in these houses for a few months, their health comes back. It's so beautiful. So, and the people can afford to live there. They have reasonable mortgages. They're solar powered, so their energy bills are de minimis. It's, it's quite something. When we look at you know, things like that and you know, obviously you know, altruistic efforts, uh, and, and we see the power in America, at least, of celebrity. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about the value of having somebody like Brad Pitt championing a thing like that? Well, what's it, I think the most important thing for me and working with Brad is that he is so authentic as a human being that any celebrity he has, he deserves from, obviously for, as a talent, as an actor, but as a human being, he's just a spectacularly genuine human being. This is real, the real thing, this person. So, you know, I don't know how he deals with it, but um, the power of celebrity, in his case, is an authentic force that he knows he has to deal with because he can't help it. You know, everybody starts swooning when he moves around for good reason. I mean, he's an incredibly wonderful human and is very attractive to be near him and around him because he's smart, he's dedicated, and, and he brings gravitas to it, which is authentic. And, he, and, and this is deep the deep work. We're trying to help people understand what the future might be and give them hope. That's what this is about. I mean, I think, that, you know, we, we have this very weird, contradictory approach to celebrity in America. You know, on the one hand, we like to build people up and then sort of trash them. Sure. And, you know, and, and criticize and throw, how dare George Clooney talk about Darfur? How dare, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, who are they to tell me? And right. yet at the same time, it's this adulation right. uh, and this sense of, you know, oh, oh I want to wear what he wears or I want to look, you know, it's, it's a very complicated thing. But when it's put to the use uh, of an altruistic use or, you know, to, to put the spotlight on an issue, uh, it seems to me uh, you know, a better use of it than, uh, you know, just put the spotlight as on As long me. as there are spotlights around, they might as well look at something good, <laughs> you know? And, and the thing to remember, people like Brad, Brad actually is a really good designer and he's really interested in architecture. But the thing to remember, we are synthetic people. In order to be synthetic, we have to be analytic and then we have to synthesize something new. Critics are analytical. They don't have to make anything. All they have to do is complain or laud, but they don't have to do anything. They don't have to create anything, see? So for a lot of people who are just in the analytical world, criticism is their stock and trade. So they're just trying to get interest, and if it's more interesting to criticize negatively, get more attention, they're gonna do that. So it's, it's really, sort of in order for us to do our eco design thinking and innovate, you know, we have to think about ego management at the same time, but sometimes it's the ego of the person who's, you know, not paying attention to what we're trying to accomplish and they just want to focus on whatever the, it is that interests them, which is fine, it's normal life. Easier to stand on the sidelines than to get in the game. Well, I, you know, the, there was nine 
$9 billion posted for sustainability consulting last year. $9 billion. When I started all this and consulted with people, you know, we were alone, right? Alone. And now $9 billion spent on sustainability consulting. If you look at it, it went to all the people who are doing the metrics. They're recording how people are being less bad, right? Showing carbon reduction, showing toxic reductions, as if it's okay to do toxins or carbon in the atmosphere at this point in history. So it was $9 billion spent on scorekeeping, not creative work to get rid of these issues. Interesting. This would be the equivalent of going to a football game to watch the scorekeepers, right? What we're looking for are the people who are willing to get in on the field, figure out where the goal is together, kick the ball, you know, run, fall down, skin your knee, bang into stuff, get up, do it again, you know? That's the game. So as we do our work, you know, it's not easy what we do. We bang into walls. We try stuff out. We had a, a wood that we were trying to use in New Orleans that was not using pressure-treated chemical wood for outdoors. And there was a product that was being sold that could do this using amorphous glass, which sounded very exciting. And the company had gave it a 40-year warranty. And it started to rot. So we have to replace it. Well, we're innovating. We tried it. We're going to make them replace it. OK. You know, it's what you do. You try stuff out. You fix it. You move on. You know, you try things. You have, that's the way it is. It's, I hadn't thought of this. Before. It's fascinating because you're obviously a very public figure. You've been awarded president, mm -hmm. lauded by Time Magazine. So obviously, you know, that, with, that kind of attention comes mm -hmm. with it. Then you get criticism. Oh, yeah. So as a public figure um, who maybe that wasn't your plan initially, you know, you kind of wanted to become an architect or a designer. So now you right. become this sort mm -hmm. of spokesperson. And mm -hmm. How do you deal with that, just as a, as a, I mean, as very, a person? At the beginning, it was like very hurtful, because there are people who say, you know, you can't be, you know, you can't just be perfect, so there must be something, you know, we can complain about. But I found it very, you know, strange. And you, and you learn to just try and stay, stay centered with what you're doing, keep your center of gravity low, and keep moving. You know, Gandhi had an amazing thing on this. He said, first they ignore you. Then they ridicule you. Then they attack you. Then you win. <laughs> That's fabulous. That's fabulous. Yeah. And I think what we're doing is good for all every all the people and young people get it in two minutes, and it's exciting for them. So we're you know it's great. Let me ask you this: You mentioned at the beginning of our interview um, China. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot of work there. Been there many years. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for, as an outsider, we look at it and we see obviously this incredibly quickly growing economy, uh, rising middle class, uh, and yet also, you know, the problems that come with a modern uh, mm -hmm. economy like that. Pollution, can't go outside, they're afraid to let the kids play, asthma through the roof, having to wear masks. What's happening there and should we be optimistic or should we be, you know, pessimistic? Well, I'd say the first thing to realize is, um, these are unintended consequences of rampant behaviors. And when did we see that before? How about in the UK? They had crises in air quality in London you know, in the 50s. We had crises in the US, 69, Chattanooga, you need to take two shirts to work. They were, they were driving around at noon in Chattanooga and Pittsburgh with headlights on. We forget that. Now, we exported all the foundries because we don't have those. We have Clean Air Act, you know, and they don't, right? So, all these things we're seeing, and it's horrifying. They just declared millions of hectares off limits to agriculture, which is very desperate for them, because they're toxified. The soils are being toxified. The rivers are running black. Kids are getting sick. They've got, they have cancer villages now that are being cataloged by the hundreds. Uh, they can't see each other in Beijing. So they're hitting the wall. So what we're seeing in China is sort of everything we did, took us 200 years to do, they're doing in 30, right? But it's it's who we were, but in a very compressed form. So if we stop and think about it, you know, this is the next task is to clear the air on this one and get moving. And the Chinese will do that. They will move. They're moving at all levels. I mean, they're building the biggest wind industry in the world just overnight. They have, you know, they have 350 super high-speed trains. How many do we have? How about? And you know, that's Even our five years later. And our high speed trains are crawling between two points. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. So when they get their mind to it, but it's a horrifying thing, industrialization without care for these issues. And if we look at it historically in the big context, in the 1700s, certainly in the United States, but coming out of Europe with Hobbes and Rousseau and Locke and so on, these, this idea of natural rights 
coming out of the Enlightenment and human rights is the beginning of the erosion of feudalism, primogenitor and divine right, right? So you start to get this idea of equality. It starts, it gets, you know, in France, US. Then the next century after Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, we have the economy, the market economy. Again, the destruction of feudalism, primogenitor, right? Where the market starts to happen. And you get communism, you know, you got capitalism, right? But you have a market. So social market. And then we have a social market economy coming in the 1900s, but it's forgot the environment. So the 1900s, we had equity, then we have an economy, but then 1900s, what do we get? It's the pollution century. And the Chinese caught up as fast as they could. <laughs> Right, so at the end of this last century, we're crashing into the wall of pollution because we were unprincipled and we had discovered fossil fuels and, and we don't have an energy problem. That is not true. We have energy all over the place. The problem is a material problem, which is carbon in the atmosphere. It's a material carbon, which we should love. We are carbon in the atmosphere. Oops, wrong place. A material in the wrong place is a toxin. See, what we should stop and realize, we got the lead out of our gasoline because we don't want lead in our rivers in our children's brains. It's a neurotoxin. Carbon in the atmosphere is just like lead in a river. It's a toxin for future generations. Well, how long are we going to let our children suffer from this poison? So get that out of there and let's get on with the world. So the next century, and the Chinese understand this, is the ecological century. Because then we can have fairness, equity, economy, the market, which we understand is very powerful and then ecology, which is our home. And you put the three together and you get what the Chinese are now calling, and working with them on, is the ecological civilization. That's interesting. So at the end of the day, are you an optimist about this? Or, because you're on the front lines of the bad stuff and the good stuff. Right. So, you know, uh, is it just a glass half full, glass half empty, or uh, is it half full with pollution? What, what's the state of your well, brain Well, somebody right made now? a joke about me the other day that as a designer, you know, I don't see the glass half empty pessimist or half full optimist. I think it's always full of water and air. So the glass is always full and we can define what's in it. The real issue here is the glass isn't big enough. See, So we have to offer opportunity to all our children everywhere. So when somebody says, oh, we're running out of resources and we're growing our demand exponentially through population or consumption patterns and things like that, you can't have a system with declining resources and exponential growth. It doesn't work, right? You have to either be insane or an economist or something. <laughs> I don't know. You know, who can say we can keep this up? You can't eat your feet, your grain, your feet grain, you know, your seeds. Yeah. That's what we're doing. So we can't mortgage the future, right? If, if we mortgage the future, then the world belongs to the dead and not to the living. Right? So if the world's gonna belong to the living, we have to live, live from current income. And so that's what we're seeing now, is this notion that we have to have a glass big enough to share. So we don't want to throw things away. Away went away. We don't want to downcycle everything into park benches on their way to landfills. We can actually recycle and we can upcycle materials because we want to create an endless resourcefulness in the economy. That would be a circular economy. And an endless resourcefulness of things. And so everything becomes food, either food for life, food for technology, or food for thought. And that way, future generations have hope, and they have things to work with, and the world keeps getting better and better and better. Otherwise, we're Well, uh, when collapsed. it comes to uh, food for thought, you have uh, given us quite the meal today. I, uh, okay. I, I appreciate it very much. And uh, join us again, I hope. I look forward to it. And you keep watching. We have some more scintillating guests uh, like uh, Mr. Verdano coming up in a minute uh, here on HuffPost Live. Keep watching.